morning. Welcome to Northgate. Good to have you here. Uh, if you don't, well, if you know me either way, if you know me or don't, my name's John. I'm one of the pastors here. We're talking about relationships being complicated. If God is going to really be Lord of all, he needs to be Lord of our relationships. And we're looking at some of these primary relationships. Last week, we talked about being married. Next week, we're talking about being single. The week after, we're talking about being children, how we relate and honor our parents, whether they're alive or with us or not. Um, and I appreciate people's patience through this, right? Because some people were here last week and they're not married, and some people are here uh, this week and you're not parents or you'll be here next week and you're not single. And so we're kind of applying these things where we are in our lives. But I thought what Pastor Vern said um, about educators is a really good reminder as we start talking about being parents. And that's that you don't have to be a parent or a biological parent to influence a child, right? To have an impact in their lives. And so I encourage you uh, to approach that from this way this morning as we talk about being parents. Now, I feel especially ill-equipped to talk about this subject today, right? I, I just, I do because I'm still in the midst of this mess, right? There's generally only two groups of people, from what I've observed, that uh, think they kind of have parenting figured out. The first are people that don't have kids, a lot of them are pretty sure that they know a lot about parenting. This was really fun for us because Amy has two younger brothers and neither of them had kids up until this last year. And so one of them knew a lot about being a parent before he was and now he has his own and it's just been delightful for us. <laughs> to watch that and to help him process through that. On a family vacation a little bit ago when he was asked about that, he said, I said a lot of things about a lot of things. And we said, yeah, we know. And we've enjoyed that transition. The second are people whose kids are old enough that they've forgotten how hard it was in the day-to-day -day grind, how hard it can be. Some, but not all. I need to give that disclaimer. Some people who have grown-up kids can be the most encouraging people in the world to parents with young kids. You really can be. Pastor Vern has been such a big encouragement to me as a parent of saying, you know, hey, I see you guys doing this. I see you doing this well. Uh, Mark Logan has been somebody else that's just been a really great support. You know, as, as his kids are older than mine. And I remember the first day my oldest child went to school, uh, he and I went out for lunch and we talked about the day he put his oldest child on the bus the first day. And, and we hear a lot here, the, the, those of us with younger kids, you know, hey, enjoy these years. These are the best years of your life and you're going to miss them when you're gone. Now, usually they're saying that to us when we're exhausted from having been up all night and they're like coming back from an Italian vacation or something. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, right? Like, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, I feel like you're enjoying your stage of life as well. So I'm up here today because I'm called to preach, not because I'm a parenting expert. Let me be real clear on that. I'm not even the best parent in my house, like not even close, right? I'm a distant second there, and I screw up parenting on nearly a daily basis, pretty close. A couple weeks ago with one of my children, and I will not uh, give you her name because it wouldn't be gracious of me to do that, <laughs> We, we were having an interaction, and she can be a little bit of a yeller sometimes. And I, I grew up in a house where there's a lot of yelling, and I really, I don't like it. I don't want that. That's not what I want for my house. It's not what I want to be. It's not what I want for my kids. And so she was yelling. She was getting upset, and it finally got to the point where I very calmly said, that's it, you gotta go to your room, go, go. you're out of here, go to your room. And she stormed up the stairs, right, and just pounded every stair, and I was waiting for it, I'm like already cringing because she gets to her door and just boom, right, slams that door, which immediately just like sends chills down my spine. We have like, I think it's 14 stairs, I used four of them to get to the top, right? I like tore, I'm not even joking, I tore up those stairs, and I went in, and in my mind, this was going to go better because I was really worked up now. And I said, you know, well, this is not what we do. That, this is not that kind of house. And then I yelled, you need to learn how to control your emotions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. In, in the moment, the irony was not lost on me either. As I said it, I was like, oh, darn it. I'm going to end up apologizing for this later on. And so a little bit later, my wife very kindly brought that up um, and said, I don't know that you want to be yelling about other people controlling their emotions and, um, you know, it's probably not the kind of dad you want to be. And I sat there silently and then later went and apologized to my daughter. And I said, you know, I was like, hey, we both need to do better. I said, I'm sorry. We both need to do better. And if you want to know how trying kids can be, because I didn't grow up, I didn't get apologized to as a kid, right? Adults were right, kids were wrong. That was just how it went. And so I tried to do that. I said, I'm sorry. 
we both need to do better. And she said, yeah, you definitely do. <laughs> I was like, meet me in the middle, right? Meet me in the middle here. So let me give you one of my favorite parenting quotes. This may comfort you. It may not, depending on where you are. Andy Andrews said, the goal is not to raise great kids. It's to raise kids who become great adults. I think that's really important to keep this in front of us. It's a really important distinction because some of you are like, all right, I mean, that sounds good. It's not a real big difference. I would tell you it's a pretty important but subtle distinction because when kids behave well, sometimes they just do that out of obedience. They do that out of the fear of the consequence of not behaving. In fact, that's really how it starts off, right? At a certain age, there's no problem with that. But if that's still the motive as they grow older, it becomes more problematic. When I was 16, I generally didn't drive 100 miles an hour because I was worried that I would get pulled over, I'd get a ticket, and I'd lose my license. Now, I don't drive 100 miles an hour because I'm aware of how dangerous it is for me and for the other people on the road and because of the gas mileage. The gas mileage would be terrible at 100 miles an hour and that would really hurt my feelings. So when kids behave well out of obedience or out of fear, it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to transfer to adulthood when they're out on their own. So to raise kids who will become great adults, we have to help them develop character traits, things that will go with them into the next chapters of their lives when we're not there to look over their shoulder and to instill fear or to demand obedience. So our main point today is that the ultimate goal of parenting is to instill and develop character traits in your children that will shape their future choices and actions. That's the goal, that's what we wanna do, that's the aim. Again, just as I told you last week about planning about what kind of marriage you, we wanna have, I would encourage you to be very deliberate about how you want to raise your children. Right? Be intentional about that, about what kind of kids you want to raise and what the goal is. You know, if you're trying to raise kids that want to come back home as they get older, like what is that? Amy and I were at a party when she was pregnant with Grace, and she was about five months pregnant. She was pretty, she was pretty far in here, and somebody asked us kindly, they said, so, why do you guys want to be parents? And neither of us had an answer at all, right? We were like, uh, I mean, it's just we had a house and a dog already, so like kids were... <laughs> That was the next box to check. We've gotten better about that since then, but I just remember feeling really ill-equipped to answer that question. I was like, I don't, no one had asked me that yet. But if we approach parenting with the idea that we are trying to instill and develop lasting character traits that will ultimately help our children make healthy choices and strong actions as they grow up, that will begin to impact our year-to-year, -year, our week-to-week, -week, and our day-to-day -day decisions. So the ultimate goal of parenting it is not to give your kids everything that they want. In fact, I'd argue that would be one of the quickest ways uh, to erode character development. And I think that's a struggle of, of parenting. I think that's a struggle. There's a lot of us that are, are in a, a more comfortable situation, right? We, we have enough money to do things that our parents didn't get to do with our kids, and we want to give our kids those things. We want them to have great experiences, uh, but we don't want to raise spoiled and entitled brats either, and it's this, this balance of how we do that. Last February break, um, Amy and I took the girls on a cruise to the Bahamas, and we'd been on a, a bunch of cruises, and we decided we'd take them and see uh, if they liked it too, and they did. And I, that morning, my concern was this, especially, you know, some of our experiences I've had in Mexico or in Rwanda, you know, was just, I just want them to be appreciative of what they have. And so the morning of the cruise, I said, listen, we're in western New York, it's like 20 degrees and snowy and we're about to get on a plane and fly to a place where it's 80 to get on a boat that is fancier than anything you've seen in your life and cruise to a place where it's like 85. The only words I don't wanna hear on this trip are that's not fair, right? It's like I don't, I will not hear those words. I said, you're right, life is not fair and if fair's here, you're way over here, right? You're far on this side of fair and that's because I wanna give them things but I don't want them to have that entitlement. But your ultimate goal is not to give your kids everything that that they want. Your ultimate goal of parenting is not to raise kids that are happy 100% of the time. Kids that are in here, if you're still in those phases, your parents do not need to make you happy 100% of the time. They're under no obligation to do that. Building character takes discipline. Discipline is not pleasant at the time. I have a child who regularly tells me I am a terrible dad when I discipline them because I'm making them unhappy. And my response is, that's not my goal. My goal is not to make you happy all the time. My goal is to help develop character in your life. Your ultimate goal of parenting isn't to have other people praise you for being such great parents. I would encourage you, young parents, accept it graciously when it comes, right? You don't have to seek it, but if you're in a restaurant and somebody comes up to you and they say, your kids are so well behaved, what a beautiful family, just say, oh, thank you, right? Don't be like, you should see them at home, 
They're terrible, right? Don't, just accept it. Just take it. But don't make that the goal. Your ultimate goal of parenting is to instill and develop character traits in your children that will shape their future choices and actions. And parenting experts, almost all of them will tell you the best way you can do that is to help your child develop a strong sense of identity. Because if you know who you are, you'll know what to do, right? You know how to respond in a situation. We try very hard to instill this. And so even when behavior is not good, we will use phrases like, that's not the kind of girl that you are. Like, I saw what you just did to her, and I know that's not the kind of girl that you are. Or I'll say, this isn't how our family acts, right? Our family doesn't stomp up the stairs and yell about controlling our emotions. That is not how our family acts. And listen, nothing Absolutely nothing is going to ground your child's identity more than a real knowledge of and love for Jesus. Nothing is going to do that better. So please, let us help you with that. Let us help you with that. That's why we would invest the time and money that we did to improve our children's ring, right? Because we, we believe deeply in the importance of that. That's why we would bring Leah on, on staff to help lead this team to make sure we're doing the best possible job we can in that area. Because as your church, our goal is to partner with you to help your children grow in their knowledge of and love for Jesus. I've got this down here, so you're good. Um, that's our goal, is to partner with your children to help them grow in their knowledge of and love for Jesus, to partner with you. Last week, Pastor Vern, he talked about Leah's three rounds of interviews, and uh, I was in the second round of interviews, and it was an intimidating room, right? There's like seven people interviewing her, including super intimidating people like Mark Logan and Nate Varland, who's the chairman of our board, um, and she was doing really great, but there was one particular spot where she really won me over, because Pastor Dan, he asked a question with a great preface. He said, I'm going to ask you a question, and I don't think there's a right answer to this. I was like, man, all right, Dan, set her up for success. Um, he said, what's more important, the relationship with the children or the relationship with the parents? And I was intrigued. I was like, that's a great question. And she thought about it and she said, I think the relationship with the children is really important. I think a lot rises and falls in that. That really means a lot. But I think the relationship with the parents matters even more because we only get them for one hour a week. But if we can partner with the parents to help them be a part of what we're trying to do, what we're trying to develop in their children, then they have a lot more and that partnership can bring a lot better results than we ever could on our own. And Dan said, that's actually the right answer. There is a right answer and that was it. But there's only one problem with her answer. That was the assumption that people bring their children to church every week. That would give us about 50 hours a year with your kids. Far too many people, they come once or twice a month, which is 12 or 24 hours a year. And on top of that, some people, sometimes the same people, you're fully relying on us to help your children grow in their knowledge of and love for Jesus. You're putting all that on us. I want to make two loving suggestions as one of your pastors. First, be here. Be here. You guys are here today. You make worship a huge priority in your household. Now, none of us are here 52 weeks a year, so don't, don't take it that way. I get weekends off, or volunteers get weekends off, you get weekends off. I take one Sunday a year off and go to a Bills game, all right? I'm going to do that and go to heaven. That's my plan. I'm doing both. <laughs> I know, I know the kids get sick, I know that people travel, I know stuff happens, I understand. I'm not talking about those Sundays. I'm just talking about the Sundays where it wasn't enough of a priority, right? Where maybe you didn't get moving on time and then you realized you weren't going to be on, you're going to be a little late, and so you just packed it in and decided not to come. I've made a commitment that I don't, I like to give people a hard time, it's one of my love languages, but I don't give people a hard time for coming in late, right? That's the second edition of the book where they include that sarcasm as a love language. Um, I don't give people a hard time that are coming into church late because here's why. If you come in at like 11.15, you are getting ready and you realize we're going to be late. And there was a moment where you could have just said, let's not go, right? Let's just pack it in. Let's not go. We'll go next week. But you pushed through and you decided to come anyway. So when you come in, I want to honor that and I want to thank you for deciding to be here anyway. I don't want to ask you if you're here for the 1130 service, right? I want to celebrate that because you did it. You made it a priority. So make weekly worship a priority. Do it for yourself. If you're raising kids, do it for them as well. Because I say this all the time, I believe that God has something for us every single week. And I think the same thing is true for our kids. It might be a verse that they hear, a song lyric, a concept that gets planted in their soul, and maybe that resurfaces when they're having a bad day at school or when something happens on the bus or it's just not a good time at home. But God can't resurface what we haven't done the work of planting. So one, partner with us by getting your kids here. But second, 
Partner with us by taking an active role in your child's faith and knowledge about Jesus. One of my favorite emails that I get sometimes is from a parent asking, hey, how do we discuss this, right? How do we discuss something about Jesus or faith or the Bible? Uh, And I like that because then I know you're doing that. I know you're involved in that. You can't rely on us to teach them everything that they need to know. You can't. We're going to do our very best, but that's going to come up short. That's not our goal. That's not what we expect from Leah. That's not what we expect from our teachers. And one of the sections of Scripture, and we read this before baby dedications, it lays this out perfectly. Some of you have heard this so many times, you might not even realize what it's talking about. And that's in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, where it tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols of your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, first of all, don't miss this part. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Parents, you will not be able to share with your kids what you don't have. I know a lot of people and plenty of good people who do not have a love and a passion for Jesus, but they bring their children to church hoping that somehow we can override that. And I celebrate that. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you are doing that for them. You know, I'll hear people say, well, I'm not really into that stuff, but it's good for the kids to learn. If your heart isn't about loving the Lord with all your own heart and soul and mind and strength, the odds decrease that your child's heart will be turned towards God. It's not impossible, and we could share great stories of that happening, but it really makes it harder. It really does, and this is important. And dads, listen, you don't get to sit this out. I'm glad you're here. If you're hearing that, you're here today. I want you to be here. Be with your family. Go to church together as a family. And you are here, so that's good. I grew up in a church that was like pink walls, flowers, right? It did not feel like men were welcome here. And one of the things I love about Northgate is it doesn't have that feel, right? There's a lot of wood in this building, all right? It's just some manly stuff. And we, we try and make it a place where people will come, where families can come together. I had somebody a little bit ago say this to me, and I loved it. We were in the lobby and we were talking, and somebody walked by and he goes, Man, there's so many guys here that are not church guys. And they would tell you, I don't like church. I like Northgate because this is my church and this is a place I connect and feel at home. So be a part of it, dads. Don't sit this out because if dad doesn't come to church, you know what happens? Once your son, if you have a boy that reaches a certain age, then they think, well, I'm a man now, so I don't have to go to church either. And then they sit it out too. So if you're in, you're in. This is either the truth or it's not. If you think that Jesus and God and faith are good for your kids, it's good for you too. The correct answer to any question that your kids ask you about God is not ask your mom, right? We can be involved in this. We can be a part of this. So those things, they need to be on our hearts if we're going to impress them on our children. But then look how clearly this is laid out when it talks about when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. It's got all these parts of life that are in there. And I want you to know that we don't have to try and force or coerce our children into becoming Christians. I'm not that worried about that conversion moment because you can tell any kid about hell and you can scare them into making a decision pretty quickly and easily. That's what happened with me. But it isn't the same thing, or isn't that the same thing as having kids that just obey out of obedience and fear, right? Is that necessarily going to change their lives or impact the decisions that they make when they're older and they're making their own choices? And that's what I'm much more concerned about. So instead of trying to coerce them into a conversion moment, our job is much more just to talk to them about Jesus. And these verses, they lay this out really well of when and how we should do that. When should parents teach their kids about Jesus? When you're at home, when you're in the car, during your bedtime routine, during your morning routine, build Jesus in to these things. When you're at home, just be deliberate about it. Be deliberate around the table about the conversations that you have. Ask your kids about what they learned in church today. What was their lesson? What was their takeaway? Watch movies and things that have some redemptive qualities so you can promote discussion. You can have teachable moments and say, hey, what did, what did you guys think about that? How did you feel when that happened in the movie? It says, do this when you're walking along the road. So for us, do this when you're in the car, when you're traveling, right? Find some Christian music that you like. 
I, I really enjoy, I listen to a lot of Spotify. I'm not a, a radio guy. Some of you really like K-Love, that's cool. Um, but I listen to the Northgate Spotify playlist quite a bit. It's the songs we sing here. You can listen to it on the way to church and then come and sing the same songs. But find some Christian music that, that you enjoy because my kids complain because I really only listen to Christian music. Like in the morning, I'm like, this is what we're listening to. And they're like, ah, oh, church music. But also they know the songs, right? They're getting planted in their hearts. Do it during your bedtime routine. Take it past just the, now I lay me down to sleep, right? Ask your kids about the highs and lows of their day and see where you can interject Jesus in those moments. See if their hearts are clear. Say, is there anybody that you need to forgive? Is there anything on your heart tonight as you go to sleep? I would encourage you, this is a great time for verse memorization. Amy's done a lot with our girls because they're a little fearful at night, right? It's dark and it's quiet. And, and so they've learned a lot of verses, you know, um, different like uh, Philippians 4, 8 and Psalms 4, 8 and a bunch of other verses that they've memorized and that's their time uh, to recite those and to get those fresh in their minds as they go to sleep. And then during your morning routine, demonstrate these things in front of them. Demonstrate what it looks like to have a life that is focused on Jesus. My oldest daughter, Grace, uh, age five, she said, Daddy, do you know why I read a chapter out of my Women of the Bible book every morning? Because Mommy always does that. And I thought, well, that looks like a good thing to do. She calls it her devotions. You can't put a price on living this out in front of your kids. You can tell them all you want. If you do it, it will start to change things. So in order to try and build lasting character, into our children. We teach them about Jesus and we show them how much of a priority he is in our lives. And we talk to them about what he's done and what he's doing in our lives. Just like I don't try to hide my past from you guys, I don't try and hide it from my kids either. Um, it's led to some interesting discussions, right? Like if one of your daughters is like, well, you've never been arrested, right? And you're like, yeah, right? I mean, you gotta, but you gotta own it, but guess what? You get to show them a changed picture, right? You get to show them what grace is and that God, this is why we do this. I remember having that conversation with my oldest daughter and saying, I wasn't a good person and that's what God has done in my life. He's changed me and I want them to see that. Even if it comes at the expense of me, they know that that is what God does. So let us partner with you to help them grow in their knowledge of and their love for Jesus and then parent them appropriately for the stages of life that they're in. Now I was looking for these stages. Pastor Andy had a thing, parent, coach, friend, and I remember him talking about that and I was looking for that and I found something on PursueGod.org, this uh, Our Parenting article. I couldn't actually find the author, just the website. And it had four stages of parenting and I want to just kind of go through these in our remaining time and talk about why each of them matters and what we're trying to do spiritually through those. Stage one, loving discipline. The purpose of this discipline stage is to teach that actions have consequences, both good and bad. So we begin at this stage, right, of loving discipline, trying to teach them about actions, trying to teach them about cause and effect. When we make good decisions, good things happen. When we make bad decisions, bad things happen. If you touch a hot stove, you get burned. I hope you don't have to do that one firsthand, but that's a great way to learn that. Now, if some of you had the same reaction that I did. You saw that and you were like, we were supposed to be done with that at age five, right? Like, we were still working on this. The, the ages on this I want you to know are not a hard and fast rule. Each kid, each situation is gonna differ. Uh, I was still getting a lot of loving discipline long after age five. Some of my kids are still getting a pretty healthy amount of that as well. But this is where the groundwork is laid, where we really start to establish that character and those convictions. This is where we learn how things work. This is where we put together uh, what consequences are and where consequences are figured out, where you think, I hit my sister and I got a timeout. I don't like being in timeout. Next time, I'm not going to hit my sister, right? That's the idea. Again, it's not always that quick and easy. And I would encourage you at this stage to be deliberate about introducing God and Jesus and faith and the Bible to them. And there's some great resources for that. We've used the Jesus Calling Storybook Bible quite a bit. They won't understand everything, but they aren't too young to be able to grasp some of those things. So begin to make Jesus a part of their life, even at this stage. And parents, in this stage, if you've got kids here, don't lose heart. Don't get soft. Don't get, let your kids get away with things that you know you shouldn't. I know that you're tired, um, but there's an ad, that's an action. Us letting them get away with things is an action that has consequences later on as well. Earlier, I referenced this verse in Hebrews 12, 11, where it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. 
So discipline, it's not pleasant at the moment. And here's what kids don't understand. It's not pleasant for us either, right? They think it's not pleasant for them. It's not pleasant for us, but we know that later on, if a child is left unchecked, it is not going to send them down a good path. This will send them down a much better path to lovingly discipline them. Make sure, though, that that discipline is out of love. Right? Always try and discipline out of love. Try not to discipline out of anger or frustration. Right? That, was, that was my big failing in that situation running upstairs was I was angry and I was frustrated and I should have sat that out. Don't discipline because you're embarrassed because they made you look bad, right? Because you're dragging them out of a restaurant or a store, right? We've all done that. And you're like, you leave your cart. And you're just like, we're out of here. Like, we're cutting our losses. We'll do this later. Don't discipline them out of that embarrassment. I tell my girls all the time, I think it's important for them to know, I love you always and forever, no matter what. I love you when you embarrass me in a store. I love you when you tell me I'm a terrible dad. I love you no matter what you do. That's God's love for us, and that's our love for our kids. So parents in this stage, don't grow weary. Don't give up. Keep going. I know sometimes it's easier just to let them get away with it and act like you didn't see it and not pick that fight today, but that's our calling, lovingly and consistently disciplining our children. And before you know it, because it seems like a long way off when your kids are born, but it will be here in the blink of an eye, you find yourself in stage two. And in stage two, here's what we see. The purpose at the training stage, which is ages five to 12 approximately, is to nurture a love for God and others in the hearts of our kids. This is where our kids begin to spread their wings a little bit, right? They go out into the world just a bit. Hopefully that loving discipline that we've instilled in them, that character that we're trying to help take root, it begins to uh, nurture a love for God and a love for other people in their hearts. I mean, that's at the very heart of what God wants for each of us. That's what he wants for us, and it's what he wants for them too. When Jesus was asked about the 613 Old Testament laws and commandments and which one was the most important, he answered, of course, this verse that we see in Matthew 22. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So we need to instill this love in our children. We need to start young. Love God and love other people. They're born knowing how to love themselves, right? Kids are born knowing how to look out for what they want and need, and, and they're very good at that. Uh, they're, you know, I've said it before, infants are cute, babies are cute. They are the most selfish human beings on the planet, right? They literally care about no one else. So we have to demonstrate for them what it looks like to put God first and put others first. If you're an infant here today, I'm sorry that in time that you can offend me or that you can forgive me. Uh, As I told you last week, marriage is a wonderful place to demonstrate that kind of love and sacrifice. So if you're raising children and you're married, make sure that they regularly see you putting your spouse ahead of yourself, right? Make sure they see that's a great way to demonstrate to them what it looks like to love God and love others, to put your spouse first. That will make an impact. And then hopefully we begin moving from training to coaching. Right, the circumstances of life, they've got us on the sidelines watching more and more. You know, we're, we're now, they're not always just an arm's length away. I remember first realizing how hard this was gonna be when Grace went to kindergarten because we had three little kids at home and that felt really hard because there was three little kids at home and they were always there. They didn't have jobs or anything. They're just always in my house. And then I was like, man, this is tough. This is probably the hardest part of parenting. And then Grace got on that school bus and she was gone for seven hours and we had no idea if she was alive, if she was well, if she would return. I remember waiting for the end of the day for that bus, like pull up and stop and she got off. I was like, oh man, okay, 179 school days left. So We start to move from training to coaching because we're not always there. You're still the parent, you're still in charge, um, but you're also forced to let go more and more and let your children figure out things on their own. Let them make some decisions on their own. And so that is the coaching stage in the teenage years there. And the purpose of the coaching stage is to release your kids to establish their own biblical convictions. This is where the rubber really starts to meet the road. In Psalm, there's this great, uh, or Proverbs 3, there's this great uh, plea from a parent to a son where it says, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God 
And man, if you're in this stage, I want you to know the things that your parents are teaching you are because they're trying to prolong your life, right? They're trying to prolong your life, sometimes literally. Uh, they're trying to help bring you peace and prosperity. They want you to work hard so that you can get a good job, so that you can take care of yourself. Those are all things that they're aiming to do. I would encourage people, if you have kids in this stage, to pray those verses over them because we begin to get a, a sense of these things. Have they been internalized? Have they begun to form our kids? We get that glimpse now, if you're struggling with a kid in this age range, it doesn't mean they haven't developed those things. Uh, with some kids, it just takes more time and more mistakes uh, to really surface. But if they have begun to develop those things, that's really where it will start to show up. And you don't have to wait until they're 13 to start taking those training wheels off. Give them opportunities to make decisions and see how they do. Grace, last year, she got a birthday invitation from a kid in her class that's like, or in her school, that's not like a real great kid, right? Not the kind of kid we encourage our kids to hang out with. And she got this invitation and she was working through it. She's like, I don't know what I should do. I don't want to hurt his feelings. It's very nice that he invited me, but it's also not the kind of person I hang out with. He makes a lot of really bad decisions. And we're watching and she's kind of working through it and she finally decides, I'm going to tell him, thank you for inviting me, but I'm unable to come. Now listen, she was never going to that party, right? But we sat back and watched her work through it and make the right decision. So you can start that as early as you can for them to start making those decisions themselves, or at least thinking they are when you're the safety net underneath them. And then hopefully, eventually, we arrive at this stage. And again, this isn't a hard and fast thing because some of you are going to laugh when you see this one, when you see the particular ages on it. Stage four, friendship, ages 18 plus. The purpose at the friendship stage is to release your kids to become mature, responsible adults. Now, you know how some medicines are like extended release? Like you can take an allergy pill that is an extended release over 24 hours? Some kids are more of extended release kind of kids, okay? So maybe this starts at 18 and it continues till 20s, 30s, whatever it is. Uh, sometimes it takes longer before they leave the nest fully, and completely, where they make their own decisions, but hopefully when they do, they are making decisions of a mature and responsible adult. And again, I don't know if this will make you feel better or worse. I didn't start making uh, reg somewhat regular, mature, responsible decisions until like 23 or 24. Even then, it was kind of spotty for a lot of my 20s, so maybe that makes you feel better. Maybe it gives you a little bit of hope. Um, but this is where we're sitting back and we're seeing if our kids are submitting their lives to God, right? If they're trusting him, if they're following him. Proverbs 3, uh, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. And that's what you're hoping for from your kids as you send them out into this stage, right? That you will see the evidence of that kind of life in their life. Now, if they aren't following him, there isn't really a whole lot you can do at that stage other than to continue to pray for them and love them. And maybe you might have to, people use the phrase tough love, I don't know, it's just, it's love. You might have to not pay for their Verizon or their car insurance or something like that if they're making really bad choices. I would encourage you to do that. Everyone that's like 18 to 20 in here hates me right now, but it's cool. I'm just saying if you need that, right, you do have a little bit of control there. They might be legally an adult, but if they're still dependent on you, you've got a little more power. Uh, but arriving here, this is the goal, isn't it? That friendship stage. Some of you have made it to this spot. You've done the work of lovingly disciplining your child, of training them, of coaching them, and now they've begun to ascend into adulthood and you cheer them on as they go. And you have that rich reward of a lifelong friendship with your child. It's not always that way. Some of you have that with one or two of your children, but not all of them. Some of you have just been praying a lot for one particular child, and others of you are, are really blessed richly, and you have that with all of your kids. But if you're a parent, no matter what stage you're in, here's my encouragement for you today. I want to kind of start to wrap up with this. I want you to make the most of the limited time that you have with your children to make a positive, lasting impact on their lives. In any stage, in any stage, a friend of mine last week, he said, one of the biggest lies the devil tells us is that we always have more time, right? And I had never really thought of that as a lie of the devil. I just thought it was just how life works. And I thought, you know what? That's true. We have this idea that we always have more time. But whatever stage you're in, it's going to fly by. 
I thought before I had kids, the most cliche thing is that everyone with kids talks about how fast it goes, right? Like, I can't believe they're in first grade. I can't believe they're in fifth grade. I can't believe they're going to cut. It's all that we do when we have kids. But then when it's your own kids, you're like, oh, this is why everyone does this. This flies by. I had, we had babies like weeks ago, and just last week we put all of them on the school bus. I'm not sure how that happened, how they're all in school all day now, because I'm sure that they were just babies. But with the time you have left, however much it may be, make the most of that time. Show them the love that you have for Jesus. Make that a priority in your own life and in your family. Help them develop lasting character and convictions and integrities that will impact their actions and their decisions. Because we all desire to give so much to our kids. Every parent I know, they want to give their children the best the world has to offer. I think every good parent is motivated, motivated by wanting to give their kids good things and great experiences, by wanting them to have a better childhood than we had. But remember this, when you walk out of here today, have this planted deep in your heart, that the greatest gift that you can give someone is an introduction to the God who loves them. It's the absolute greatest thing that you could give to your kids. No trip, no toy, no experience, no opportunity that you can offer them can compare with the life-changing impact of a real and vibrant relationship with the God who created them and the God who loves them even more than we do. Let's pray. God, thank you for the calling, Lord, to, to raise our children. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to do that in a way that glorifies you. God, that you would give us the encouragement when we need it, that you would give us the, the kick and the pants when we need it, Lord, to dig deep and to keep going, and that, God, ultimately, we would raise children who know and love you and who become great adults and who glorify you in their life. So, Lord, be glorified through how we parent so that our children can grow up to know and love you and change the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.